so then we can get more questions and answers in the session. We have about 25 minutes for that. So the first question, please. Yes, sir. So identify yourself, sir. My name is Ashwini Rai. I'm a retired professor of uh, JNU. I'm a little nervous about saying this because I'm not too sure whether we would be ac I would be accepted as part of we. And my question begins from there to Mr. Sakthishina. Uh, you know, it's a very, all his presentation about what we represent is so seductively attractive. It's like liberal democracy, which all of us are now accepting it as a value, but not very sure whether all of us are implementing it. My question, to be very brief, to respond to the chairman's uh, you know, clear injunction that it should be a question, who are you representing or identifying as we, ours? I'm a little uh, you know, nervous because I'm not too sure I would entirely agree with all your of the conclusions about what we represent as part of we. Understood, sir. We yeah, got you know, in other words, if it is we, our India is as a civilizational identity for the last 5,000 years, there are, then there are problems about your conclusions in the empirical sense. If you are referring to we and our, as represented by the policy of the government of India from 2014, then of course I don't have too many questions. I may have slight disagreement about its empirical validity of your conclusions, but I would understand what you are trying to say. You got it, if sir. Thank it you. Is 2014 thank you. India. So is we've what understood, we sir. Thank you. I mean, you want me to reply immediately? Okay. Uh, sir, why do you say 5,000 years? Where did you get 5,000 from? Exactly my point. The same we believed in 5,000 no, no. 5, that I'm talking is about. A con general consensus. Again, it's a consensus word uh -huh. which is very difficult. Uh -huh. uh, I am exactly. using yesterday's presentation in the inaugural address, despite Amartya Sen saying that we are an argumentative society. I believe in this. So I thought general two. consensus is our civilization is about 5,000 years old. Two. One, as a student of history, I would humbly disagree, but I'll leave it aside for a moment. The same we comes from the same we who believes in 5,000 years. I started by saying there is no single variant. I was very clear there is no single variant. There are multiple variants. Certain things, and I don't talk about 2014, I'm not here to talk politics. I'm tracing it from the time Nehru becomes the convening of the 1946 conference, from Nehru's prime ministership, and the various steps that why, were we, why was India not promoting democracy, even though we firmly believe that democracy is good? This is the same we I'm talking about. Okay, good, sir. Thank you. I have a question for uh, Frederick. Uh, thank you very much for a very lucid explanation of the reasons behind European awkwardness today. Uh, I was trying to internalize a whole set of reasons uh, you gave. I was trying to hope that uh, you would also perhaps try to balance the reasons that give pride uh, and a sense of confidence to Europe. Uh, because after all, it's still one of the most prosperous regions in the world. It has a very rich history, abundant capital, tremendous bank of science and technology, uh, and uh, a huge diplomatic talent, uh, a tradition. So given all this, would you say that, uh, uh, you know, this lack of confidence, rise of pessimism, uh, a general sense of angst, is that the only hue or is it balanced by a certain degree of optimism and hope about future as well? Thank you. Shall I? Yeah, please. Uh, That's right. I, the way I would characterize the temperament in Europe right now, I'd say it's pretty pessimistic. Um, and that's not because people don't appreciate many of the good things that exist in Europe, like, for instance, prosperity, um, 
in most countries, access to good education, access to good health care, that we have thriving um, economic sectors that tend to do well. Um, I think the, the, the consensus is rather on other issues, and that's where sort of the pessimism comes from. Um, for instance, that in this broad development of digitalization in the economy, most of these companies tend to come from another, another part of the world, and consequently, Europe is not going to prosper as much as others are going to do because of it. So even if it's good for Europe, uh, it's a source of at least perceptions of injustices, economic injustices. And that's what we're seeing behind many of the new barriers to uh, technologies that come up in Europe, many of the new regulations that come, many of the trade, uh, 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 sort of growing trade disputes that we're seeing around access to the European market for, for technology. Um, I think there's a similar sentiment in issues around the growth of, uh, of uh, markets and economies in other parts of the world. Um, I think the, there is close to consensus among policymakers in Europe that, uh, not in the words of Donald Trump, that other countries have taken advantage of Europe, but if until 10 years ago, there was almost a consen consensus around the point that there was a great injustice in the world trading system in the sense that rich countries had uh, prospered far more than developing countries in the world. And indeed that some developing countries may have paid the price for the prosperity that had arisen in Europe or in America. <coughs> now the consensus is shifting in the other direction, which is that the rising economic powers are prospering far more on the open economy than Europe does. And in that sense, I think it's sort of similar to uh, the type of, of trade rhetoric and trade policy that we're seeing in America. So even if there are lots of advantages and assets in Europe, and even if we have a diplomatic uh, uh, core, which is, uh, you know, very finely talented and has achieved quite a lot in bilateral relations as much as, as multilateral institutions, I think we are seeing a trend where uh, domestic political tension is shifting away from developments in other parts of the world to what's happening either inside Europe or inside countries themselves. And consequently, that there will be far less political backing for uh, those institutions and those people, uh, to which I would include myself, who wants Europe to be uh, far more internationally oriented and have a presence in world affairs, uh, 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 which is not as the one we had in history, but one that responds to the fact that we have so many linkages and so many interests in what's going on in the world that we should be there and take part in those discussions. Uh, gentlemen sitting behind Professor Muni, identify yourself, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, sir, uh, my question is in general to the panel. How can India articulate its values uh, uh, in its engagement whenever that happens, an intellectual engagement, not a strategic or a political engagement, with the struggles of the people in Baluchistan or the Pashtun Tahafuz movement, for example, because here are people trying to protect their cultural or civilizational identities against a state in many ways is an artificial construct that has been imposed upon them. Thank you. Well, the problem begins, uh, you know, with some of the contentions in your question, which is that Pakistan is an artificial construct. We may think so in India. Most Pakistanis would disagree. And if you see, I mean, if you're asking specifically about the Pakistan, uh, the Pashtun, the Hafus movement, if you see the way uh, Pashtun uh, views of Pakistan have, have evolved over the last 40 years, it's quite interesting because the PTM is very much of a movement of Pashtuns demanding rights as Pakistani citizens, which is quite different from earlier protest movements which we have seen uh, in the uh, 
northwest frontier, what is now called uh, uh, the Khyber Pakhtunkhwa uh, province. So I think, I think we need to reflect much more on uh, concepts such as artificial uh, constructs before we use them freely, because it really, uh, it doesn't pose a question. It only makes a statement. And uh, from Pakistan, then they will respond to your statement rather than try to answer your question. Yes, well said. Uh, Professor Munisa, and the lady uh, after that. Thank you. Two, two questions come observations related to Ambassador Raghavan and um, uh, Shakti Sena. Uh, to my simple mind, most of the uh, countries uh, try to package and balance ideals with the interests. Uh, sometimes they succeed, sometimes they don't. Uh, and I think India is no exception to that. I think we have always tried to blend or package our ideals with our interest uh, in terms of democracy, which you underline. Uh, and uh, I have done this in my book to see, and wherever uh, a conflict between the two occurs, I think uh, ideals and, uh, sorry, the, the interest and strategic considerations override. And, and we set, set aside the ideals. Now, why will it change with the Chinese coming into, uh, into South Asia? I don't understand that. In fact, I don't see that. Uh, if, for instance, see India's articulation of uh, connectivity, and you find all the all, whole of it littered with values, uh, transparency, no sovereignty, openness, uh, no uh, debt burden, everything. Which, uh, which comes out of the criticism of the Chinese. Uh, sometimes it is surprising that uh, on the question, more sensitive questions like Tibet and others, we don't raise uh, human rights aspects or the autonomy of culture and religion. And uh, uh, in terms of democracy, in terms of human rights, I see no, no change which might take place. Why, did, why, why you hold that with the Chinese? The basic parameters, the template which we wanted to uh, project is going to be redefined. Uh, on Shakti, you know, the most of uh, uh, the statements which you have taken about India's policy projection are uh, articulations of foreign policy. And at various places in, in, in history, in past, this is how we have uh, projected our self-image. Uh, the problem arises when on some of the critical areas where India intervenes. I mean, why should it intervene if we, we accept the uh, diversity? Uh, which is not explained. And I wonder if uh, many times, uh, even in the, under the present regime, uh, we push values which uh, really uh, almost bring down a breakdown in our, our relations with the countries or, or breakdown of the foreign policies. So how do we explain in terms of what we are pleading and what we are doing on some of these critical issues? Not every time, not everywhere. Thank you. Well, thank you. You see, what we see as values uh, are often seen as, uh, in our neighborhood, as our interests. Uh, and this is inevitable because what, for instance, the European Union sees as a projection of its values, we see as a projection of their self-interests. And it is the same when we, uh, when we told Sri Lanka, for instance, in the 1980s, that why don't you study the federal provisions, uh, provisions of the Indian Constitution when uh, trying to address your Tamil uh, problem. The, the Sri Lankans saw it as a projection of Indian interests rather than a projection of our constitutional values. My point is that those days have ended because you have a great power in your region and it's no longer possible for you to do so. Uh, uh, the, the Sri Lankans or the Nepalese have options which were not available in the 60s, 70s and uh, 80s. And my view is that we should wake up to this new reality. Maybe I didn't get the full uh, this import of the point. Uh, but taking off from what TC just said, I don't think so we really go around pushing our values to the extent that, you know, one, well, of course, going by step back. Yesterday we had a good discussion on values and interests. Where do they flow from? They're not, are they inherent? Obviously, they're not inherent. You know, I'm not going to that argument. So in that sense, obviously, countries would choose 
would really would not like to choose between values and interests. But when it comes to the crux, obviously you defend yourself. But I don't see ourselves trying to intervene with our sets of values anywhere. Not today, not in the past. I mean, when we agreed on Panchil, critical element was non-intervention in the internal affairs of others, which we violated to a peril in Sri Lanka, as Ravi very rightly pointed out. So I really don't think so that, and post-2014, definitely not. I mean, I, through my mind, extremely careful. We do slip up, we do make mistakes. Federalism is one of them. I've talked on federalism in Nepal and in Sri Lanka, only to be greater with hostility that you want to break us up. I said, no, learn from our example how it actually strengthened us. But I said, I'm not being prescriptive. I'm only giving you our experience. If you find it relevant, fine. If you don't find it relevant, just reject it. So I don't see the imposition of values coming in the way of uh, our putting our values up front, which would definitely lead to a breakdown in relationships. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm Ritkyusha Tiwari, and I teach at Delhi University in the Department of Political Science. Um, my question is to each of the panelists. One short question to all three of them. Um, different questions. We are so, four of us, actually. Uh, so, okay. So I have the question for the three of you. Uh, so I'll go by. Uh, <laughs> I'll go by the order of the speakers. Uh, so my question to Ambassador Raghavan is. Uh, um, you did mention about certain constitutional templates um, that have helped in uh, the neighborhood of India in their times of crisis. Would you care to elaborate on those certain constitutional templates? Because um, it could also be that these are generic features of almost all the constitutions which are post-colonial in nature. So how does the Indian constitutional template stand out significantly in that case uh, uh, to Sri uh, Sinha? My question is that... Uh, um, I mean, would you like to elaborate a bit more in, in cases of tensions between individual right and community rights? You did mention, uh, and you did allude to uh, specific cases where we have a certain sort of value system in place. H uh, how do you exactly look at that tension which, which arises from time to time? Um, and to Mr. Erickson, my question is, uh, would you care to comment upon the nature of uh, regionalism in Europe, uh, going by what you've already said as to how uh, the European countries are looking at you know, their role in, in the world politics and also looking at what, would, what they would like to take up on and what they would not like to really interfere in? Thank you. Uh, but to try, very obviously, look at your own constitution. Article 14 says no discrimination on the grounds of sex, caste, language, religion, etc. Right? Individual rights, fundamental rights, most important. Immediately after that, we said, however, for the socially disadvantaged, we shall have separate, you know, you allow positive discrimination. So you are always very clear that even see the first Supreme Court judgment on the article of Section 377 on the Nas case, the homosexuality case. The Supreme Court, the initial judgment, we thank God they overruled it in the review petition, which is the rare thing, was about fine, some people are there, but if it upsets the larger community, what do we handle it? Fact is, obviously, you have to stress on human individual rights. But when people are not in a position to assert their agency, do we have a role to play in helping facilitate their ability to then become a participant in the democratic process. So therefore, we, had the, we have a very good system. I'm, I'm a big supporter of reservations in schools and government jobs for the scheduled castes and scheduled tribes. To me, it makes lots of eminent sense, even though it violates the fundamental principles of Article 14. So that is the kind of tensions I'm talking about. My point also was that, where, uh, that it's no coincidence that we've had very good relations with those countries in our neighborhood where we have approached them without taking into account our own constitutional principles. Uh, and where we have tried to use our constitutional uh, principles as a template, uh, relations have suffered. And if you look at India's relations with other neighbors in South Asia, you'll get a, uh, you know, you, you'll see what I, uh, what I mean. But, uh, but the issue is not a new one. It goes back to the 50s and there was this famous exchange of uh, letters uh, 
between Nehru and Liaquat Ali Khan, when Pakistan then drafting its constitution, which never came to be, used the word Islamic Republic, and Nehru immediately responded, but this is medieval, how can you uh, do this? Uh, what about the minorities in East Pakistan and, uh, and elsewhere? Uh, but uh, Liaquat Ali Khan said that, you know, you're a different country. I am adopting my own constitution. What possible business is it of yours? And that, I think that, that debate is worth reflecting on, that our constitution is ours, and no matter how much pride we may take in it, it's possibly not a template for our neighborhood. All right, thank you. Uh, just two points that I'm going to make. The first one is on regionalism in the form of European cooperation and the fact that we're seeing uh, growing tension between different fraction of the EU membership that wants to go in different directions. What they all have in common is that they like to see uh, uh, far less presence of the European Union and far less power of the European Union in defining um, what happens in in the economy, what happens in member states, or what happens uh, in relations to other parts of the world. So to generalize, perhaps uh, generalize a bit too much, but you can say many of the northern countries tend to be of the viewpoint that, you know, the EU should shrink its budget, it should devolve more power back to the, to, to the member states, um, and that it shouldn't be so aggressive in pursuing new forms of regulation that reduces competition uh, in, in, in the European economy. You have countries like France and Germany that wants to have more power to the member state by diluting uh, pretty profound and core economic rules of the European Union, like for instance, competition policy. Uh, they like to see much more of domestic money being invested in uh, domestic firms that will uh, of course compete on other European markets. So. And then you have countries like Italy, some of the Eastern European countries that wants to roll back uh, collaboration on border issues, migration issues, Schengen issues uh, in, in terms of free travel inside, inside the EU, et cetera. So even if, even if there is not a commonality in policy substance between these different groups, they all tend to want to take the EU in the same direction, which is to make it less uh, consequential for uh, domestic concerns in Europe or for Europe's presence in the world. My second point on Europe's and sort of ideas about Europe's role in the world, I think there is uh, uh, sort of an equal amount of distortions between different countries, different type of viewpoints uh, there as well. Also what they all have in common is the growing gap between on the one hand the rhetoric and uh, ambition to change the habits of the heart of other people, and on the other hand, uh, 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 not having access to policies, instruments, economic resources in order to actually put any real power behind uh, many uh, many of these ideas. And I think that that gap is is we, we're seeing it ever more in Europe. Um, uh, I mean. Look, for instance, as just sort of developments this week, we had um, yesterday where um, a, a common agreed position on, on banking rules and in order to try to reduce uh, money laundering uh, that European banks participate in other countries. So the European Commission had proposed policies in order to deal with that, which all member states had been uh, agreeing upon uh, in the abstract a few, a few months ago, but as soon as uh, an actual policy came up, uh, all member states but Belgium withdraw that support immediately because they realize that they don't have the economic resources to back uh, uh, what, this, what this policy uh, actually would entail in terms of, of relationship to uh, countries like the United States and US territories. Uh, relations to Saudi Arabia and, 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 and so on. Um, another example is on European policy towards Syria, um, uh, where right now there is no common approach from Europe towards Syria, partly because of fractions internally 
uh, between member states, in part because there is such a gap between, on the one hand, uh, the rhetoric and, on the other hand, the uh, sort of decline in presence of diplomatic or economic uh, uh, assets that actually could deliver what that rhetoric in abstract is trying to say. Um, and so I think this is sort of, and, and you have sort of regional fractions in the EU also as far as foreign policy is concerned and what relations we should have, but I think they all sort of are returning to what I've been used to very much because I'm Swedish, so I'm, I'm, I'm used to growing up in a small, power, not, not very powerful economy, but that had very strong opinions about how others should behave, uh, but no actually, no actual instruments in order to get that change to happen. So we're all, all becoming like Swedes. <laughs> That'll be the day. Uh, <laughs> Ma'am, last question to you, please. Uh, thank you. I'm Devi Anwar from Indonesia. My, my question is to <laughs> Frederick. Uh, you have painted a very rather dismal picture of uh, EU in disarray. Uh, looking forward a bit, Brexit and then the US withdrawal uh, from its transatlantic leadership in which Europe has been reluctantly accepting its position as a junior partner. Uh, will it in fact have a silver lining in terms of forcing Europe to debates about its European identity. The England has always been the odd one out, you know, storm in the channel and Europe isolated and that kind of things. Uh, the debates about, remember, in the early days about Western European Union, its own strategic autonomy and s maybe shifted a bit from just a civilian power to becoming a more European uh, military power, which of course the UK had always resisted. So can, can you talk about that a bit? Yeah, sure. I mean, I mean that's a, it's 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 a known seminar to start with, so it, it's a it's a very big issue. Uh, my first point is going to be: if you think I'm dystopian, then you should listen to what other Europeans are saying about the future of Europe. I'm probably going to be categorised as one of the optimists, uh, uh, and I'm sort of still one of the few uh, cad carring members of European federalism in the sense that I believe in European collaboration, and and I, I, I really hope uh, that it's, it's going to have a successful future. Uh, my second point sort of is that um, uh, Brexit itself um, is of course causing a lot of friction uh, internally in the EU and we're seeing uh, several indications of how different countries are beginning to pre prepare for themselves uh, in the absence of the UK as being a voting member of, of the EU. Uh, most of these issues are going to concern economic issues, not so much the broader uh, concept about what is European identity, what is the strategic autonomy, how do we define the strategic autonomy uh, for Europe, and how do we uh, construct a policies that actually attend to that particular ambition. Um, so there, is, there, are, there are frictions there, but I'll, I'll, what I would say is firstly, um, I think the departure of the UK is less consequential than most people think, partly because the UK has been sitting on the fence on most issues for a long time and not been uh, a country that had participated with its own idea uh, about Europe, what should Europe represent and Europe's uh, uh, role in the world. Um, uh, Britain often thinks of itself as being sort of a leader of Europe and I often laugh when I listen to all those politicians in, 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 in Britain who talks about sort of, you know, the free trade ethos of, of Britain sort of, and how they are leading Europe towards more openness, etc. Well, you know, over the past 15 years when I've dealt with commercial policy in Brussels, I've found myself to be far more in conflict with UK governments than I've been with other governments on core commercial issues. If you, for instance, want to have an explanation to which country in Europe destroyed the prospect of an EU-India free trade agreement, well, you have to look no further than to the UK because UK wasn't prepared to accept uh, one of the few interests that UK, sorry, that India had in that negotiation, which concerned far more openness for, uh, for uh, the movement of labor from India to, uh, to Europe as, as part of that agreement. It wasn't you know, Italy or Belgium or 
any other country that, that sort of argued against that, that proposition. It was the UK. Um, um, Boris Johnson was, is here in town uh, today and is giving a talk at India Today. They have a big conference, um, the media conglomerate. Uh, my wife was there, she's a journalist, so she, she's been there listening to him. And, and I think sort of she, what she told me is that it's pretty significant what Boris Johnson said. It's not sort of this free trade buccaneering, open global Britain, which he was trying to sell. It's much more the notion that, you know, you Indians don't forget us. Uh, we still want to collaborate with you, and 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 in that sense, sort of a, a I think much more significant, much more representative of what I see as as the British ethos uh, uh, right now. Uh, finally, um, uh, I think the departure of of, uh, of the UK, but far more important developments in America, is forcing upon Europe right now a bigger discussion about its own military security uh, and what they have to uh, uh, deliver uh, in order to have their own autonomous uh, capacity to defend itself. Um, I think that's a good, good discussion to have, but I think what's significant about it is that we talk in the context of the defense of Europe. We're not having extensive discussion in Europe about the use of European military or military resources in other parts of the world, not for sort of offensive purposes, but for peacekeeping or for that type of issues. Here we're rather talking about a Europe that still lacks the military infrastructure capacities to participate in many, many of these, uh, in many of these uh, projects in other parts of the world. Um, and, and I think it is pretty significant for the, the context of this entire discussion that it's far more sort of the hobbits that are concerned about the status of their own shire. Uh, it's not sort of uh, 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 the people who aspire to have, uh, make contributions and provide leadership to other parts of the world. Like the they did. You do have NATO to protect you. Europe, Europe has NATO to protect it. So the European army in itself is, can't Europe be has such the United a States. urgent goal. NATO is, you know, in terms of defense purposes, NATO is nothing but the United States in, in terms of defending Europe. It's, commi uh, it's committed. I'm, I'm, uh, forgive me, please, but you know, Sorry. I think if we want to stay with time, uh, we need to wrap up. I think some very important points have been raised in this session. Uh, they also leave behind some questions unanswered, as was just being discussed while we were trying to wrap up. Uh, this is a big subject. Uh, it requires a lot of deliberation. It also requires uh, a little patience to understand there are multiple points of view. For me, uh, based on the points that have been raised by uh, eminent speakers, one or two questions I think we need to also think about, that when India has gone into engagement with its neighbors without uh, using uh, any ulterior agenda, but going by our constitutional values and making investments there, take the case of Afghanistan, uh, many would argue that there was perhaps a bigger aim than what was officially spelled out. Uh, Ambassador Raghavan is very well placed to really give us a perspective on that, but that calls for another debate. Uh, it is also something which I need to understand that when you push for small projects with parties, groups, NGOs, whatever, and you find the people accept it, obviously, because in many of the countries, at least in our neighborhood, and that applies to India also, the government per se doesn't do all the right things. And when you come in with funding, smaller governments that live off all sorts of money that comes their way are probably irked that you are bypassing them. And I'm not talking of governments in our neighboring countries, I'm talking of governments within states in India also. Uh, uh, but, uh, but so therefore, 
it's it's a it's a bit of a tricky task that you could do it and you could have values but will uh, the neighboring country then bring up the sovereignty issue and to what extent can you go in there and finally i mean there's much been said uh, by frederick about europe uh, but it goes back to the point which i made earlier that you're perhaps more comfortable engaging with and doing good things with people like us and therefore, the satellite states were more easily accommodated, but spreading European values are big of a bit, bit more of a challenge where you don't have people like us. Uh, just some thoughts. I wish to thank uh, Ambassador Srinivasan in particular for having given me the opportunity to sit on the table with such illustrious speakers. Uh, thank you for your patience. I think we've stayed with time, and we are now waiting for our next distinguished speaker for the keynote address. Please give the speakers a hand. Thank you.